welcome Mark Mazzetti here to kick off our fall speaker series with a bang, definitely. He, uh, as you saw in red, I'm sure, was a 2009 Pulitzer Prize winner along with a couple of New York Times colleagues uh, for coverage of the White House's response to escalating violence in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And that was after being a finalist the previous year for his work, which exposed the CIA's destruction of the tapes regarding interrogation techniques of al-Qaeda prisoners. And prior to the New York Times, when he's on leave right now, writing on his first book, um, he works with The Economist, uh, US News and World Report, and the LA Times. Um, so Mark, thanks for joining us, and welcome. Thank you, um, uh, first of all, for inviting me. Um, and it's great to be back, and a tre tremendous privilege um, to speak to you guys. Um, and it's also great to see old colleagues, um, Tom and Joel, um, from the US News uh, and New York Times days, and um, catch up a bit. Um, and as I told Tom, if, if you want to, ever want to swap jobs, let me know. Um, this seems like a, a terrific place. How do you go about reporting um, sensitive information, uh, and how do you then decide to publish? Well. Um, the answer is, you know, we talk to whomever will talk to us. Sometimes it is people who come to us. Um, more often than not, it's people we reach out to who we find may have left government or maybe still in government and try to find, you know, get them to talk. Once we uh, find information that we think is newsworthy, um, then, uh, and believe it is true, uh, which is important, um, uh, then we make the decision about, okay, do we want to publish this? You know, what we will always do, uh, whether it's actually a national security story or an education story or a White House story, is you'll always call for comment. It's sort of standard journalistic practice. And um, so we will call, um, you know, the Pentagon and say, you know, their public affairs staff and say, listen, we're running, we're running this story. This is what we know. Um, and um, this is what we're going to report. And, um, you know, in the, in the vast majority of cases, um, you know, we ask for comment and sometimes they'll say no comment or they'll give some of us, um, you know, maybe a bland, um, you know, on the record statement. In very rare occasions though, it then, um, they, they sort of, sort of escalate things where it's, um, uh, we ask you not to publish this story. Um, and, uh, that's happened a number of times, uh, since not only on the Times, but certainly before that. Um, and they will usually say something like, um, you know, what you have is um, uh, very sensitive, uh, could put people in danger. Um, you don't even know what you don't know. In other words, you, you know a piece of something, but if you only knew more, um, uh, you realize the dangers. Um, what then happens is um, we say, okay, well, if you guys believe this, um, uh, then you have to talk to my boss. And um, it sort of escalates up a chain uh, where um, if they really care, um, and if it's a really significant thing, it will be, you know, the editor of the New York Times talking to Secretary of Defense or the CIA director or the Secretary of State. Um, and that's the sort of sign of how much they really care is sort of who they want to put on the phone. Um, I mean, it's extremely rare that we just kill a story outright. Um, it is less rare that we would delay a story for a period of time if they can make a convincing argument that, um, you know, in three days this story is going to be less secretive and you'll still have a scoop and, you know, nothing will be lost. And what's even more common is there will be aspects of a story that will be um, taken out, uh, details that will be taken out, um, that if we make a decision that um, it's not um, totally newsworthy for our readers or important in the public interest to know some little specific detail that we've come up with, that if they, again, make a convincing case, um, should be taken out for security reasons, um, then, um, then, then that happens. It's interesting because um, this was always the case. These were the, these were the rules in the age of journalism when it was uh, n magazines and newspapers and TV networks. And um, uh, people sort of followed these na uh, rules. Now, um, increasingly though, um, the question is, well, if it appears on a blog, right, um, and may not have even gotten much pickup, but it's out there. If someone's name is out there, um, then do we, um, do we report it? It's actually a really 
it's a it's a question that hasn't been resolved yet, and uh, I don't think we at the Times have any real policy yet on um, overarching policy of when we do and when we don't. We report n things that are newsworthy and that are, uh, that are out there, and, and we don't ignore things that are out there. The other rule is um, that you know we we don't publish things that we think would necessarily lead to direct harm or uh, it might not have a, um, a real public interest. So this is like the type of stuff that I think we're still wrestling with in the age of, in the digital age, in the age where media has changed so much. Um, and for when you guys go um, out to, um, you know, into the field and in, in your jobs and may, maybe may already be journalists and coming back to do this program, I mean, that's what you're going to sort of um, encounter.